My name is Rob Stewart. I'm going to talk to you, give you a survey of the multi-threading support available in C++11 and how it compares to what's in Boost Threads. So we're going to talk about asynchronous computations, which is a new idea that's part of the standard now, new terminology. We'll talk about threads specifically uh, later on as a, a more detailed or a lower level component, and then synchronization primitives. So we'll start with these asynchronous computations. The standard has several new terms in here, but it all has to do with your asynchronous task. You want something, a callable of some sort, function object, a function, whatever, you want that to run asynchronously. And to do that, we have asynchronous providers, asynchronous return objects, and a somewhat nebulous concept called a shared state. The asynchronous provider's job is to run the asynchronous task for you, and to communicate status of that back to you through the asynchronous return object. Shared state is just something that they happen to use to implement some of that. That's where some of the information is stored and we'll see how knowledge of its existence is important but you don't need any information about how it's implemented. So we'll talk about stood future and stood shared future as the examples of the asynchronous return objects. We'll talk about stood async, a function template, stood package task and stood promise as our examples of asynchronous providers. So we'll start with these asynchronous return objects. The idea here is you've got, with a stood future, you have a unique object that represents the result coming from an asynchronous task. One-to-one -one correlation here. Its whole purpose is to get you that result back. You can block on it until the result's ready. You can wait for a limited time. You can say, I'm willing to wait for just a few seconds and then I need to get back to something else. There's a one-to-one -one association with the provider as well as with that shared state. And a very interesting characteristic of stood future is that once you get its value, once you get the result from your asynchronous task, you can't get it again. So you better save it if, you, if that's important to you. So here's what it looks like. Default constructible. It's not copyable, but it is movable. So you, creating one yourself isn't of any use because you need an asynchronous provider to supply the information that it's after. So the default constructability is only useful to you if you're going to create an instance somewhere and then you want to move one that a provider gives you into that instance so you've got it in a different scope, for example. It's got three f specializations, so get comes in three different flavors depending on that specialization. The primary specialization returns by value. The reference specialization returns by reference to non-const. And the void specialization returns nothing. And you might think, well, why would I call get to get nothing? And the answer to that is that the purpose of get is to retrieve the result that the asynchronous provider has marked as being ready. In the case of void, it's the same thing as just calling another function we'll look at in a moment, wait. You're just saying, let me know when the result is ready. In other words, when the asynchronous task is finished. In that case, since it returns nothing, that's all you get to know about it. Another interesting aspect of calling get is if the asynchronous task throws an exception, that exception is saved, squirreled away in that shared state we saw before. And when you call get, that exception will be re-raised. So when you call get, you'll get the exception as though you had called that asynchronous task directly. Get will block then until the result is ready. That means when the asynchronous task is finished, the result has been set, now you can get it from get. Valid does not tell you when the asynchronous result is ready. It merely tells you that, in essence, this is not a default constructed future, or it hasn't been moved from, that it has an associated uh, asynchronous result to give you at some point. Yes? And after you call get, what will valid return? If you call valid after you call get, you get false. Yes? Please repeat the question. Yeah. You'd think after all the time during the keynote, I'd have figured that out. What do you get when you call valid after calling get? The answer is false. It tells you there is no value to retrieve at that point. 
Share moves the contents out of the future into a shared future. And we'll look at what you can do with shared future, why you want it, how it behaves. But the idea here is that you empty the future. Remember, future is, has unique ownership of that asynchronous result. So once you've taken it out by calling get, or once you've called share to send it off to a shared future, it's gone. Okay. Now there are three different ways that you can wait on a future. If you call wait with no arguments, it blocks until such time as the task is finished and either a value has been set or an exception has been set on the shared state such that the future could retrieve it for you. These two look a little complicated and we're going to see this pattern show up a bunch of times so I'm going to talk them through in detail here and then when we see them again you'll come to recognize the pattern. Wait for the underscore for suffix is going to show up in many different cases Wait for means for a certain duration, for a certain period of time. I want to wait for five seconds. I want to wait for 10 milliseconds, whatever, that kind of a thing. From now, I'll wait a certain period of time to see if the result will be ready. If it's not, you'll get back a future status. What is that? Well, we'll see that one on the next slide. Just reserve judgment on that for a moment. Wait until says, based on a certain clock, wait until that clock reaches a specified time. So you can choose what clock you're going to use. Is it the system clock? Is it the high uh, frequency clock? Is it some custom clock you've created? This is all using the new Chrono library. You may not have looked into that library yet, but if you want to use these facilities, you need to get familiar with it. The wrapper part here is merely a um, the representation, the, the integer type or whatever that's being used to store the duration, and then the period is a ratio. So that's indicating uh, what fraction of a second that duration represents. And it could be a multiple of a second actually using the, the ratio class template. So you could wait for days, or you could wait for microseconds or nanoseconds or any number of things. And to call that, for example, you might say stood chrono milliseconds one. And that says, I want to wait for one millisecond. So they have helpers that make some of that easy to, to use as well. Wait until then is an absolute time. I want to wait until the system clock says that it's 1130. That kind of a thing. OK? So we'll see those again. So you should recognize that pattern henceforth. OK. Um, sorry about this going off the edge. I did try to zoom it to correct that. It, it was not really responding well to the buttons. So. Future status is an enum class. You may not be familiar with enum classes yet. They're showing up a lot. The idea is basically it's the old enum you're familiar with, except you always have to use the full scope name. So in other words, stood future status, deferred, stood future status ready, and so on. Deferred means that the callable's not yet invoked. That only happens in one case in the standard library. We'll be looking at that later. It's with stood async. That just means that it hasn't yet been invoked. Things are in place, ready to happen when you say it should happen, but it hasn't yet occurred, so there's no result to be found. Ready means the result has been ready. The asynchronous task finished, the result or the exception has been set. You can now retrieve it without blocking by calling get. Timeout, obviously, we know what that means. Boost future has a couple of variations. It has a continuation notion. There's work being done to add this to C++14. I don't know what the, the status is offhand. But the idea is you can provide another callable that will be invoked when the result is ready. So just automatically, without you having to call get and then queue up another callable to, to do something else. Yes, Michael? It's uh, being considered for TS in 2017. OK. So what Michael was just saying is that as part of C++ 17, in a TS actually, the continuation is uh, being contemplated. Yes? I guess that the callback is invoked in the thread context of the asynchronous task or the, the originator? The question is whether the callback, this continuation is being invoked in the uh, asynchronous thread or in the uh, caller's thread, it's, it's the asynchronous thread. It's the separate thread. 
It also offers a get state function, so without having to wait, you can actually get back the future status effectively. And it's swappable. Okay, why are we washing out the screen? <laughs> Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to have some fun with lights today, okay? All right. Moving on to stood shared future. This one is a little different from uh, stood future in that you can have multiple shared futures referencing the same shared state. So here the idea is. Uh, instead of a one-to-one, -one, I get the value, it's done once. With shared future, they're copyable. Each one can access the same value. And as a consequence of that, you can actually uh, see it more than once. Access to shared state is synchronized. What this means is when you've got multiple shared futures and they're each in a separate thread and they're all asking for the value, that access is synchronized. What's not synchronized, however, is if you have the same shared future instance and you call it from multiple threads. Now you've got a problem. You have, you, when you're trying to manipulate it, trying to wait on it, different things like that from multiple threads, one instance, that's a problem. Give each thread its own copy, you're good to go. So here's what this one looks like. Default constructible, movable, co it's not copyable, uh, wait, sorry. It is movable, not copyable. This is a converting constructor. It moves out of the future into the shared future. Remember for future, it had the shared member function that returned a shared future. That works through this mechanism here. You can uh, move a sign from a future into a shared future. But remember the idea is always that a future either is the sole owner of the asynchronous result or it's got no ownership at all. It's got no reference to it. So if you're taking it away from a future, you're moving it out, putting it into a shared future. Yes? Uh, question, what's this equals delete syntax? I'm not familiar with that. The question was, what does equal delete mean? This is new C++11 syntax. With C++98 to mark something as non-copyable, you either derive from boost non-copyable to make it easy on yourself, or you declared a copy constructor and copy assignment operator private and chose not to implement them. Well, with C++11, you can now say those don't even exist. That's what delete means. Yes? So how do you make more than one shared future? How do you make more than one shared future? Because I made a mistake. <laughs> uh, it, I believe, actually, I might have had these two reversed, that they're not movable, but they are copyable, or it may be I just copied a, a slide bad and they're not actually deleted here in either case. Michael, do you know whether they're movable? Okay, so they're both movable and copyable. That's just a typo on my slide. Sorry about that. All right, same as for stood future. We've got get, valid, wait, wait for, wait until, all that good stuff works the same way. We also have is ready. So future didn't have this. Future has valid, so you know whether there's even a, a, an asynchronous result to retrieve. But is ready simply tells you it's now ready. So if you call get, it won't block. You don't have to call wait first to, to determine that. Has exception and has value tell you whether you actually got a value from the asynchronous task or whether it threw an exception. In other words, it's telling you that when you call get, you will get a value or it will throw an exception based on what these return. <coughs> and of course, it's swappable. Questions? Yes? When would I use the shared future versus the simple one? When would you use shared future versus the uh, simple future? The question, of the, the answer is when you need multiple threads to potentially have access. Consider Okay, now he's inversing, inverting the question, why would he use the simpler one instead of this one? If only one thread ever needs the result, there's no need for this. If you want it is ready, has exception, has value, then the only way you could get it is through shared future. <laughs>
presuming you didn't need those, then the, the decision comes down to whether multiple threads or multiple contexts need access to the value. Consider an example like recalculating a spreadsheet. One cell can reference the value from another, can reference the value from another, and so on. So you could use shared future in each one of the places where you need the, the value from a single cell. And once it's finished calculating, then all those other ones that are dependent would be able to get the value and do their own computations at that point. Yes? Um, and wouldn't it also be the case that with a shared future, you're paying a performance penalty because you have that synchronization on pulling values out? With shared future, because multiple instances are referencing the shared state, there is additional synchronization involved in order to access the shared state. So that's a, an additional cost, yes. Any reason, do you know why it was considered unnecessary to know the state of the simple future, the non-shared future, as far as is ready, has exception, or has value? Why is that only shared? I don't know the answer to that. Anyone? Sorry, I didn't repeat that question. Uh, the, the question was, why did uh, stood future not offer is ready, has exception, has value? I don't know the answer. I was hoping Michael might, but apparently not. He, somebody may be looking it up. That could be helpful. But at any rate, I don't know the answer. So if you want those, you've got to go with shared future, but that has a slight performance cost. As with future, boost shared future offers uh, this get state so you can retrieve the, the state without having to wait first. Yes? So the question here is, on stood future, since there's no way to query whether it's ready and so on, how do you avoid the race of blocking, waiting for the result to be ready, then getting it, and somebody else getting it, that sort of thing? Make sure there's only one thread that's ever trying to retrieve the value from a stood future, and then it's single-threaded code. You don't have to worry about any racing. All right, asynchronous providers. So now we've looked at how to get the value out of your asynchronous task. We now want to look at how the standard offers mechanisms for putting those values or the exception into the future in, and, uh, of course, running your asynchronous task. So the first one of these is std async. This is a function template that gives you two different ways of running your asynchronous task. One is to run it immediately in a separate thread, and immediate is, of course, subject to scheduling and all that sort of thing, on demand in the calling thread. And you say, wait a minute, I'm going to run it asynchronously in the calling thread? What do you mean? Well, the idea there is you can set it up to be run at some future point when you're ready in whatever thread you choose. You then can trigger that the asynchronous task gets executed. So you're kind of setting it aside for a moment and then using it at a future point. Uh, the purpose of std async is to give you very simple usage compared to creating threads and managing all kinds of other things yourself. We're actually going to look later at how you might implement std async, give you an idea of what, all's, what all machinery is behind this interface, but also will help tie together a lot of the pieces that we're looking at up to that point. So this is not exactly how, I mean, I got to try to see if I can get this thing to behave. Yep, come on. I made it worse and it's not helping. <sighs> yeah. Turn on the lights, that would solve it. Come on. Yeah. All right, I'm not touching it again, except I do have to hit something to make the de zoom thing go away. All right. We'll leave that now. Okay, now you can see. Here we've got just a simple function f, takes a double, returns an int. And we're going to call std async right here, pass in f, pass in its argument, 1.0, highly inventive value. Notice that async returns a future. The future is parameterized by the type that we want get to return. We do whatever else we want, and then we call get. Simple usage. The notion is that it's going to be running somehow asynchronously. As we'll see, that doesn't run quite as asynchronously as you might think. Okay, so the callable can be a function pointer, can be a lambda, can be a, a functor, can be a member function pointer. Notice that if it is a member function pointer, you pass also 
the uh, argument, which is the object pointer that you want invoked on. The function objects can even be move only. So move semantics has shown up in pretty much every corner of the standard. Here's what async looks like, two different forms. There's a simplified form that just takes the callable and its arguments, and another form that takes a std launch argument. We'll look at std launch on the next slide. There may be an awful lot of line noise on here for some of you. This is new C++11 syntax. I'll walk through quickly. Uh, this is declaring an argument pack uh, named arg, so that's variadic templates here. So we're taking any number of arguments, including zero. And we're computing the result of calling f with that list of arguments. So whatever that particular f would return, given those particular arguments, that is the result. And so we're going to use that as the return type uh, or the, uh, the type with which to parameterize future. And std launch then we'll see on the next slide. So here, this is the callable, notice the move, and that's how we uh, use the argument pack. This is part of uh, perfect forwarding using that syntax. So basically the idea is all those arguments are perfectly forwarded to the callable. It's invoked with those arguments. And whatever type f returns with those arguments, that's the type the future is expecting to get. Okay? Push it again. Hello. Great. Now I can't advance slides. What is, what's going on? Um, what? Over here it's asking me to resume the slideshow. I didn't know I stopped it. There we go. Okay. Stood launch. This is another enum class has several different types or uh, enumerators in it, async, deferred, sync, which is also just an alias for deferred, and any, which is the combination of the two. Async means spawn a new thread to run the callable. Pretty simple, that's what you thought async uh, would have done in the first place. Deferred, on the other hand, says wait for someone to wait on the result and run it in that thread. So here's where I was talking about you would save it for later. The idea here is when you call get or wait on your future, in the calling thread, that asynchronous task is finally executed. In other words, you call async, you set the thing up, but you give it deferred, it doesn't run. It's only when you finally get around to calling get or wait on the, the future that it actually executes. Any means it's implementation defined, which means it could be async every time, could be its own thread every time, or it could always be deferred, or it could be some combination. Maybe the uh, implementation has decided it knows about the level of concurrency supported on your hardware and it'll only allow that many threads initially, and then the rest of them are likely to be deferred. It may use a thread pool, who knows? Yes? Can it uh, exit your program? Can what exit the program? No, it's not undefined behavior using any, it's implementation defined. What's the difference? Undefined behavior means that absolutely anything is allowed to happen. I, well, I think I pretty well covered it. Uh, they're telling me to repeat the question, but the, the question was what's the difference between undefined and implementation defined behavior? Undefined behavior means that absolutely anything's allowed to happen, including crashing, including shutting down your computer, starting, you know, global thermonuclear war or whatever. <laughs> Implementation defined means it's well known, but the vendor is going to tell you what they choose to do in that particular case. So there are constraints? The standard may constrain what implementation defined means, or it may not. In this case, it's, they can, all, like I said, they could all be async, they could all be deferred, it could choose to use a thread pool. There, there are, as far as I can remember, there were no constraints at all on what the implementation may do. Yes, Marshall? Um, an, an important difference is undefined behavior, you have no guarantees even that it'll do the same thing twice on two different runs. Implementation defined behavior will do the same thing every single time, and the, the implementer will tell you what that behavior is. So Marshall said another difference between undefined and implementation defined behaviors. With undefined, it could be something different every time. With implementation defined, it's whatever the vendor says, it'll be consistent. Yes? 
the, the point was just made here that using async, it must start a new thread because it must, um, it, it may not use a uh, thread pool and must start a new thread because it has to create and destroy thread locals every time. Yes? Yeah, that sounds better. <laughs> Hartman is is countering that, and I think that's that's correct. That it says it has to behave as if it started a new thread, so it could still use a thread pool as long as it took care of, you know. And it, we're talking about the implementation; they can do however they want to take care of the initialization and deinitialization of thread locals and so on. Anything else? Yes. Just want to make sure I'm clear. Implementation. We're talking about the implementation of the actual provider. Yes, the, the standard library implementation, whatever platform you're using, compiler, vendor, it's up to them to decide what deferred means. Okay, so this is a surprising side effect of using std async. Here we've got, we, we calculated the, the start time, called async using a lambda, telling it to run async, so I want it to start another thread. I'm going to go to sleep for one hour. And then down here, I'm going to do a little chrono magic in order to compute the current time, subtract it from start, cast it to be minutes, and then I'm going to report how many minutes have elapsed. So question, what will that output? Yes? It's going to wait for an hour and then output uh, uh, approximately 60. Any other thoughts? Did anybody think it was going to report something on the order of zero? Could be zero. Yeah. Uh, the problem is async, the destructor for the future has to join the thread. Yes. The issue is that the way async creates a future, the future's destructor must wait on the result. In other words, it's as if you wrote this code. The reason for that is because the, uh, you said that it was going to provide a result, so therefore you need to wait until you get that result. Don't want to break the promise that was created. We'll see more about that notion in, in a bit. But this will catch you by surprise if you don't pay attention to it. The future returned by async will block in the destructor. Yes? Okay, the point here is Microsoft's implementation of uh, future being returned by async does not block in the destructor, and they're trying to change the standard. Yes, Michael? This is a controversial point. Yes. And the standard says it's not clear whether it blocks or not, so there was a proposal to make it block um, in the destructors um, when it throws, and, then, um, and, um, and they also created another proposal which also allowed it to not block um, in the destructor, so that was Okay, so what Michael is saying is that the, the issue is controversial. There was some contention that the standard was unclear on what this behavior really should be. Uh, and so there were actually competing proposals on what that, whether that future should block in the destructor. Microsoft wants it not to block. And uh, the Bristol uh, vote on it was that it still should block in the destructor. Yes? <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that only futures returned by ASIC yes. are supposed to block in the destructor. Yes. Many other futures are not blocking. Exactly. And that's a problem which is controversial. Right. And which needs to be resolved one way or another. So the, the point that I was trying to emphasize here and what Hartman just reiterated is this only applies to the futures returned by stood async. Futures returned by the other providers that we're going to look at don't have that same issue. That's part of why people would like it not to block because consistency is a good thing. Yes? Can you go back to your previous slide? So, oh, never mind. Okay, never mind. okay. No issue. All right, moving on. Okay. Boost async has a couple of differences. Um, 
notably, there are no arguments here. It's not using variadic arguments yet. So um, that's by default. If you then jump through a few hoops, you can get variadic arguments. Particularly, you have to define boost, thread, provide, signature, packaged, uh, task. Sorry, it wrapped. I tried to shrink it so it stayed on one line, and it just it changed on me. Um, so yeah, you have to define that man, uh, animal there. And then if your platform does all of these things, then you get variadic support with uh, boost async. OK, so that's the first of the asynchronous providers. The next one is std package task. This one allows you to package a callable. Notice I didn't say anything about arguments. Package a callable for asynchronous invocation. It's, it could be used as a uh, procedure for std thread as an ordinary function argument if you wanted. You could call it directly. You can store it in a container and use it for later use. And that one is really where it's of particular interest because now you can put a package task into a queue and think of it as some work that you want done later. So you can have other threads that are pulling it off the queue and then invoking it. But we'll see that it's, it's a little bit odd for that purpose too. Um, what's really interesting is you create your package task, you then ask it for a future, hang on to the future, and hand off the package tasks to be run at some future point. So here's, here's the workflow, here's what it looks like. I'll create a package task. Notice I've got a, uh, the parameterizing uh, type here is a function signature. So I've got a function takes a double, returns an int, and I'm going to pass it this function f, can be any sort of a callable we discussed before. You ask it for its future, then presumably we're going to go hand it off for some other thread to go execute it at some point. We might do some things in this current thread while we're waiting. And then finally, we're going to ask that future for its value. Pretty simple. Yes? Um, what are the semantics if you try to get the future before it's run in another thread? What are the semantics if you try to get the future before it's run in another thread? Uh, you, you get the future here, and only after you've gotten the future do you run it in another thread. <laughs> If you call get on the future before the task actually runs, you'll just block. Okay, so here's what the class looks like. A uh, little bit of template gobbledygook here in order that we can take the uh, uh, function signature. The primary specialization is never defined, so it's only this uh, specialization here that is. So it's default constructible. It is neither copyable, it's not copyable, but it is movable. Here's where it gets interesting. We construct it with a callable f. That callable has to be callable with, the, uh, with arguments that are compatible with the ones listed here. That is, they don't have to match exactly as long as they're convertible. The return type as well. So you construct it that way. You can also influence the allocator that's being used to allocate the shared state to hold on to the callable, to hold on to the return value, and that sort of thing. And then this one is just taking a function pointer. Notice that the return type here is not the same as what was called result type here, and that args is not the same as arg types here. The reason that's just to give a little flexibility so that you can use a function pointer that has compatible return type and argument types. They don't have to match exactly. Swappable, of course. So this is what you would use if you wanted to put a batch of tasks in a container? Is that what this is for? Would you use this to put a batch of tasks into a container? Y yes, that is certainly uh, a, an approach to doing it. One of the things, though, that you note is that we're not uh, bundling the arguments with the callable. What we're going to see is that we've got a function call operator and this other thing that goes with it that take the arguments. In other words, the asynchronous invocation of it is when you actually supply the arguments. So if you were using it as a work queue, then you probably want to use bind in order to bind the arguments with it before you construct a package task so that the worker thread doesn't need to know what the arguments are. <coughs> 
On the other hand, if you know what arguments, if it's always called with the same arguments, whatever that package task might be, then, uh, then it might make sense that the worker threads supply them. Operator bool uh, tells you uh, whether this instance has um, a package task, has the, the asynchronous task and result associated with it, basically telling you that it's not a default constructed instance. Get future we saw gets you the future that will eventually have the result or the exception if there was one. Function call operator is what the, that worker thread, the asynchronous part of all this, that's where we supply the arguments to actually invoke this task. Make ready at thread exit is the same animal, except there's one difference between these two. One second, let me complete this thought. The function call operator marks the result ready immediately. Make ready at thread exit saves the result or the exception, but doesn't actually mark it ready until the thread exits, which is to say that any future that was blocking on that result will be blocked until the thread exits. Yes? Okay, I was wondering, so operator, a function call operator, that I call in a separate thread that I started, and that really invokes the function, or does that spawn another thread via AC? So the question is, when calling the function call operator, or make ready at thread exit for that matter, does that spawn another thread, or is it, called, is it uh, invoked in the calling thread? And the answer is the calling thread. Reset allows you to throw away the shared state associated with the instance. Still have the callable, but now we're creating a new shared state, so you can call get future again to wait on the next invocation of it. Now, if you called reset before the previous one had completed, before it was ready, then that future is, when you call get on that future, you would actually get an exception, a future error exception with the state set of broken promise, the error code broken promise. So if you don't wait for it to complete the first time and then you try to reset and use it again, then the person waiting on it is going to get a broken promise exception. Boost package task differs a little bit. The function pointer constructor, instead of having that extra flexibility of compatible types, requires an exact match, return type and arguments. Has a valid member function that's equivalent to the uh, bool operator. And they have a special callback you can install that says if any associated future ends up waiting on the result, invoke this callback. Okay, that was package task. Now we get to the lower level provider, stood promise. This one is very much like package task in that you create the promise, you get a future from it, and then later you're going to satisfy the future. You're going to give it the, the value or the exception using the promise. Here's what it looks like. Default constructor has a destructor. Interesting behavior in the destructor. We'll look at that in a bit. Um, it's not copyable, but it is movable, swappable. You can also use uh, specify an uh, allocator to control the, how the shared state is allocated. Then it has a get future function, just like for package task. And then a number of, depending on the specialization, variations on set value and set value at thread exit. Set value's job is to save the value that the future will be able to get. It also marks the result as ready, so the future will stop blocking at that point. Set value at thread exit sets the value, but it does not mark it ready until the thread exits, so the future will continue to block until thread exit. So we have primary specialization, so we've got both move and copy semantics available. Uh, the reference specialization does only reference. Uh, void returns void. Same for the other set. Yes? Can set value of thread exit be called more than once if you process it? Do further processing, the values change? The question is can you call set value more than once if you 
discover you want to set a different value. You're welcome to call it more than once, but if you call it more than once, then you get an exception that says promise already satisfied. The reason for that is because when you call set value, it marks the result ready. Sorry, yes, set value at thread exit. It does seem to make sense that you should be able to do that. I don't know why that wasn't the case, but you'll also get the exception uh, promise already satisfied. If you if you call set value at thread exit more than once, you'll get an exception on the subsequent calls. Okay. It only allows you to set it one time. Um, I just realized uh, I'm missing set exception and set exception at thread exit. They uh, take a, an exception pointer. Sorry about that. Um, so you call set exception, you give it a std exception pointer, which you can get by calling std current exception or std copy exception if you want to create your own exception instance and then copy it. Calling copy exception will copy that object, give you an exception pointer for the copy, which you can then, which is then passed along to um, set exception. That'll be saved in the shared state. Then when you call get on the future, it'll be re-raised at that point. Difference in uh, boost promise is that it has, again, that callback you can install that if a future ends up waiting on the result, the callback is invoked. Okay, so that's asynchronous tasks. That's the asynchronous providers, asynchronous return objects, result objects, and a little bit of, with shared state in there. Any questions on all that stuff? Yes. Marshall? Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Stuff. How does that integrate, say if you're on OS 10, how does that integrate with LibDispatch? How does this integrate with LibDispatch on OS 10? Yes. I haven't the foggiest notion. <laughs> <laughs> That's one answer. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is, it, is the thing implemented on top of the native services that already exist for the platform? Are these asynchronous operations implemented in, on top of what's already offered on the platform, the, the native uh, support on the platform? I would venture to say yes, but it's up, up to the implementer. Yes? Is there any kind of algebra on features? So it's take like two features and wait on both of them, but the first one, get the first one that completes or something like that? Uh, is there any kind of algebra available on waiting on futures to find, you know, to combine it to say I want to wait until both of these are ready or chain them one after the other. That, some people are actually working at, at some of that, um, that sort of, of chaining. But I, I don't know anything about its status with respect to the standard. Yes? So um, you listed the interfaces for you know, package task and promise, and one's high level and one's low level. But when would you choose to use one versus the other? Well, so. The, we'll actually see, uh, yeah, repeat the question. I didn't even have to look over there. I saw him waving the sign. Uh, when would you choose to use package task versus promise? You would use promise uh, when you are starting threads, when you are actually running code and coming up with the answer and so on. Package task when you want to save off and reuse a particular uh, callable to invoke in a separate thread, you know, pulling it off of a container or, or something of that sort. Somebody's looking up something and wishes to share. Yes? I can tell you that uh, libc++, which is what's on Mac, is implemented using pthreads, not libdispatch. So the answer for uh, Mac people OS 10 is uh, that lib standards, or libc++, sorry, is implemented using pthreads, not libdispatch. Yes? Another use for promise would be when the work is actually going to happen on some other system and you're just reporting the results of it. This is an interesting point. Uh, another use for promise he mentions is if the work is actually being done on another machine. You can still, you can handle the, the RPC and when you get the, the result back you can then use the promise to fulfill it. Very nice. Anything else? All right, so now we move into the assembly language level of thread support. Stood thread. Uh, Based, you know, compared to package task and stood async, this is much lower level stuff. 
I don't mean to suggest that it's all that particularly difficult, just that you should think of it as you're using the more fundamental building blocks and not the higher level abstractions. It offers a, a bunch of additional uh, capabilities here. We can find out what the ID is and some of that kind of stuff. We'll look at those as we walk through the synopsis. It's default constructible. You know, oh, that reminds me, I forgot to mention on promise, if it's destroyed before you set a value or set an exception, the promise destructor will set a broken promise exception on the shared state so that the future, when you call get on the future, you'll get that exception. Uh, threads are not copyable, but they are movable. They, uh, normally you're going to want to construct one like this where you give it the callable, where you tell it, here's the function I want you to execute. The first version here takes no arguments. The second one, of course, we're passing along arguments. You can ask it for its ID. Question? Uh, which, why is it stuck on I'm sorry? I still can't understand. Why is the destructor virtual? Not, not virtual. virtual. Because you're not, this is a concrete <laughs> type, it's not a, an abstract type, so you're not deriving from it. There are no virtual functions. Get ID. All default constructed instances return the same ID, so you can compare to find out whether it's a, an instance that has a, a function associated with it or not. There is a joinable function that tells you whether the thread instance still has an, uh, is still associated with the, uh, the thread of execution. Sorry. So thinking of it in terms of P threads as the implementation say, the std thread still has the pthread t handle. It still is able to control the corresponding thread of execution, whatever the implementation might actually be. Yes? Why is that you're not able to detach it in the constructor? Because if you said the most common way to run it was give it the arguments, it seems like you'd also want to specify at that point to detach, not to call a separate function later. The question is why can't you, in the constructor, tell the thread object to Im implicitly detach, go start, run my function, and just detach, detach automatically. Uh, the only answer I could offer is because that wasn't part of the proposal. I don't know. I don't know of any particular reason against it. Join, if the object is joinable, join then says, wait until the thread exits. It'll block, it'll wait when the thread finally finishes and exits, then control comes back. Detach dissociates the two. So now this thread instance no longer has an associated thread of execution. That thread is still running. It's still doing whatever it was doing before, but you no longer have any control over it. You don't know when it finishes, any of that sort of thing. The reason you want explicit control over this is because the arguments that you pass to the thread function might be references to other state, and you want to know that the thread has finished running before you uh, eliminate what it was referencing before you destroy that data. The answer to your previous question is sort of related to that. You could have had an extra argument that says I want you to, to implicitly detach, in which case you were aware of it anyway. That's why it would not implicitly detach, of course. One thing that's interesting related to joinable join and detach is what the destructor does. If, you, if the thread is still joinable, if you have not called detach or join yourself, then the destructor is going to terminate your application. It'll call std terminate. In other words, if you don't want your application to just go away, then you'd better call <coughs> detach or join on your threads. Yes? Rob, it's, it's worth noting that that's a change of behavior from the boost thread. Yeah, I will, yeah. Uh, native handle allows you to get to whatever that underlying native implementation handle may be. So that's germane to the question of was it based on lib uh, dispatch versus pthreads on OSX? Well, you need to know what your implementation is using, what the native handle type will be. That'll then tell you what you can do with that handle, what APIs you might be able to call to influence the running thread. One of the things you don't get here is any control over the thread attributes. You don't get to control stack size. You don't get 
to control CPU affinity. You don't get to control um, priorities, any of that kind of stuff. So native handle is the only way you're going to get to access some of that sort of thing, assuming you can even control it after the fact. Hardware concurrency is a rather interesting animal. It returns a hint about what the platform on which you're running and the implementation of the stood threads library and so on thinks of the basically the concurrency capabilities of your system at that moment. How many threads basically you could run simultaneously. So in other words, how many cores there are in your machine might be the answer. Or it might not. It might decide, you know what, I have no idea and just return zero. It might return something based on, I know I've got 10 threads already running with std async, and I've got this other thing going on under the covers. I think I'll return one. You don't know what the answer is, so I'm not sure that this really offers as much value. You can read about your implementation's definition of what it gives you, but it's not obviously portable. The one constructor that took extra arguments, it's worth noting what happens there. The arguments you supply are copied to internal storage, which are then used to invoke your callable in the new thread that was created. So you can create dangling references. How could that happen? You could create a character buffer, put a bunch of data in it, pass it off to a, for a callable, you std thread to invoke a callable that expects a std string const ref argument. It compiles just fine because that character array will decay into a pointer. The pointer will be dutifully copied into the, this uh, storage set aside in the thread object. That pointer will then be used to construct a std string, which will then be bound to the reference argument for your callable. The only problem is, by that point, the uh, thread that started the, th the std thread instance in the first place very possibly went away, destroyed the buffer, and so on. So now you've created a string from who knows what. So you really need to be aware of the fact that this stuff gets copied. When you really want references, and you know what, what you're doing, that the lifetime is good and all that kind of stuff, use std cref and std ref because those, when they get copied, just maintain references to the original. Yes? Movable types are supported by std threads. So if your type is, so I, I said earlier it's copied, but it can be moved into the, the uh, thread storage. Anything else? Um, so I mentioned about the destructor. This is also something that catches people by surprise. You know, I'm sure, that if an exception propagates out of main, std terminate gets called. But it's no different in a thread. When, if an exception propagates out of the thread function, then thread will call std terminate. We ran into this one, uh, fairly recently. We had an application that under a certain circumstance just disappeared. And it was a, a daemon process running on Linux. We had absolutely no idea what was going on. It was only when we ran it in the foreground and we're able to recreate the conditions that led to the problem that GCC, the, the runtime, I guess, in this case, dutifully told us, hey, we just exited out of a thread. You know, this exception uh, wasn't caught, so called stood terminate. We figured it out, but, you know, it was just, it was one of those, whoa, really? Uh, so you just have to think of it like Maine. Don't let exceptions propagate. Take care of them all. Deal with them one way or another. Otherwise, stood terminate gets called. So then that leads to the notion, you might want to install your own terminate handler. Guess what we've done since? You install your own std terminate handler. You call std set terminate handler. And no, set terminate, sorry. One of those two, you'll figure it out. Um, you call that, you give it a function. That function is not allowed to return. But it can do anything it wants for as long as it wants before it finally aborts your program. So, uh, 
one of the things you can do is say, hey, gee, what if I've got a pending exception, how about if I decode it and write some stuff to a log file or do whatever else? The only thing you have to be aware of is if somebody tries to rethrow an exception and there is no pending exception, guess what that also calls? It's to terminate. So your terminate handler has to be smart enough to deal with the fact that it might be called in a case where there's no pending exception so that if you were to try to rethrow when there's no pending exception, your std terminate function, your terminate handler will call your terminate handler all over again. In other words, if you pay attention to recursion, you'll know if that ever occurs. Boost thread differs a little bit. One particularly nice thing, I think, is that it's interruptible. At certain prescribed points, like when you sleep, when you're waiting on a condition variable, when you are uh, calling get or wait on a future, certain other occasions called interruption points, your code is interruptible by an exception. If you call boost interrupt, uh, sorry, boost thread interrupt on a thread, boost thread instance, that will mark it as uh, being interrupted. And when you reach one of those interruption points, it will throw boost thread interrupted. If you handle that in your code, you'll know when you're interrupted. You can do your cleanup and exit and be done. Boost Threads also supports attributes. Limited, they're, it's sort of experimental. They're working at that. But the idea is that you should be able to supply some information like how big a stack you want at the time that you're launching that thread. They also add time-limited joins. So you can say uh, join for, join until. And then, as Michael was noting earlier, the destructor behavior differs. Um, if you define boost, thread provides thread destructor calls terminate if joinable, <laughs> then it acts like std thread and it'll call terminate if it's still joinable. Otherwise, you get the old behavior, which is that it calls detach. Now, one of the, uh, yes? Are interruption points related to source sequence points? They are not. They are library defined. Are interruption points like cancellation points of p threads? Same concept. Yes. Um, one problem with the old behavior of boost threads with it calling detach implicitly is if that thread still had references to state that may now have gone away because that thread's still running and you were cleaning up and you had you know, other stuff that was going on, you got rid of stuff, it could have dangling references to state and that's not a good thing. So that's, that's also why the standard requires you to make the choice. You choose, do you care about uh, state or do you not? Is it okay to let it continue running? Do you need it to stop? Do you need to wait for it? That sort of thing. Okay, namespace stood this thread. In here we have get ID. That way you can get the current thread's ID. Yield, yields the current time slice. Sleep for, sleep until, allow you to make the current thread sleep. Pretty simple. Boost thread does all that, and then it's got this interruption support. Interruption point, when you call that, you're saying, so you call boost this thread interruption point, you are saying, right at this point in my code, I am happy to entertain interruption. If you've actually been interrupted, then it'll throw boost thread interrupted at that point. Interruption requested tells you whether someone called interrupt on, a, on the corresponding boost thread object. Interruption enabled tells you something about what these two RAII classes are doing. Disable interruption suppresses interruption while it's in scope. So the idea is even when you hit an interruption point, it will not throw the exception. And obviously, restore interruption does the inverse. So create disable interruption while it's in scope. They're suppressed as soon as the destructor invokes, uh, runs, then it puts them back. And so that way, you can temporarily suppress it. But it's pretty cool having this support. OK, so I talked about a bunch of different pieces, talked about these providers and futures and, and promises and all kinds of stuff. And seeing it all play together would probably make a lot of sense. So let's see how you might implement async. Here's the signature we saw before. We've got a future 
based on the return type of calling f with that particular set of arguments. We pass in the callable and its arguments. So the first thing we're going to do is create a promise with that same uh, type as the future that we're about to return. We're going to ask that promise for its future. And so I'm just going to use auto and call it future in this case. Then we're going to create a thread and we won't worry about what it is we're making that thread do at this moment too much for one slide. We're going to detach it, let it go off and do its own thing. Now I'm assuming in this case the async stood launch flag. Okay. So we're going to detach it, let it go off in this new thread. And then we're going to move the future that we got from our promise out to the caller. So now the caller can wait on that. We've got a promise. What are we going to do with that promise? Well, let's create a lambda to uh, actually execute the code on that thread. What we're going to do is move the promise into the lambda for this argument. And we're going to forward the argument, the, pass in the caller and forward the arguments as well to that lambda. So now we've handed off the promise, the callable, and its arguments to our lambda to let it do the work. Okay, it makes sense? So we created this promise up here, used it to get a future. Now we're handing it off to this uh, std thread object to run in another thread. The caller has a future that references the promise that now this lambda is going to play with. The sh same shared state. That makes sense? All right, so what does the body of the lambda look like? Well, we're going to invoke our callable with the forwarded arguments and hopefully get back a value. And if, if it succeeds, doesn't throw an exception, then we're going to call set value on the promise with the return value. So now the future, somebody waiting on that future, they're going to call get, they're going to get that value out. On the other hand, if calling f throws an exception, we're going to catch it. And here we're going to call std current exception. That'll get us an exception pointer to the current exception, which we can then use to call set exception on the promise. That's that API that I somehow didn't have a slide for. Does that all make sense? So hopefully that puts all those pieces together, makes a little more sense out of it all. So now we'll move on to the synchronization primitives. Here we've got a bunch of different pieces, lock guards, mutexes, guards, and so on. So we'll look at the lock concepts first. Lockable has lock, which blocks until it acquires the corresponding lockable object. Try lock will not block. If it can get it immediately, great, you got the lock. If not, it'll return false. Unlock, obvious. We also have time lockable. Does all the same things as lockable, and then adds try lock for, try lock until. I bet you can figure out what those do now. So, mutexes. We have two types that are lockables. Stood mutex has unique lock ownership. It's locked once, every other attempt to lock it is going to deadlock. It's going to block, sorry. If you do it in the same thread more than once, in other words, you get some sort of recursion, whatever, and you end up trying to lock it a second time, deadlock. If you need to deal with that situation, you want to avoid the deadlock, then std recursive mutex. It maintains a counter. You can lock it as many times as you like and unlock it the same number of times. Pretty simple. There are two timed lockables, std time mutex and std recursive time mutex. So all they do is add the time lock for and time lock until. Pretty easy to do. They're default constructible and nothing else. Create them and they sit there. You can only use them there. You can, of course, pass a reference around if the other code needs to get to it, but you can't pass them around, can't copy them, that sort of thing. Okay, mutexes were pretty easy. Yes? Is there a reason why you can't move mutexes? Is there a reason why you can't move mutexes? I'm sure it's an implementation detail. I don't know. Yes? So the answer was that some implementations of mutexes rely on the address of the mutex object to, uh, as part of its implementation. So if it were moved, then the address would no longer be uh, the same. Guards. We have lock guard, which is an RAI class that 
uh, either locks or adopts the lockable in its constructor and then unlocks it in the destructor. Here's what it looks like. Nested type, mutex type is just the mutex type with which you've in, uh, specialized it. It is not copyable, but it is movable. And then we've got this destructor. Sorry, movable. Where is it movable? What am I reading? It's constructible from the mutex type. So you, the idea is you create your lock guard from a particular mutex. First thing it's going to do here is acquire the lock, which may be a blocking operation. The second constructor here, you pass in std adopt lock and the mutex, of course. And what that says is assume that the mutex has already been locked. Don't lock it. But the destructor in either case is going to unlock it. So this type is uh, neither copyable nor movable, since it's got no uh, specific move operations defined and it doesn't ha support copying, then it's neither. Hey, what do you know? No differences. The other lock guard is stood unique lock. This one's also an RAII lock guard, like lock guard, but it's also a timed lockable, which gives it a whole different flavor. That's why it's not called unique lock guard or whatever. It's unique lock. Flexible construction, it'll immediately try to you know, block and, and lock it, or it'll try lock, or it'll assume that it's locked, depending on how you construct it. And then if it is locked, the destructor will come along and clean up. So here we have um, no uh, copying, but we do have moving. The destructor, simple enough. Here's how you create it so that it blocks until it's acquired the mutex. You pass the mutex plus std adopt lock if it's supposed to assume that it's already locked. You can pass it in with std defer lock to say, don't even try to lock it. Assume it's not locked, but don't try. And then finally, try to lock, which is just uh, check to see whether it's lockable without blocking. And if so, great lock it. If not, don't. Then we have unique the, uh, these two constructors here, which ought to look sort of familiar. This is basically the equivalent of unique lock for and unique lock until, except they're constructors, so they can't be named differently. So they're just controlling how long you wait in the try mode. So it's a time lockable. So it's got to have all the stuff from lockable and these two from time lockable. What it adds also here would be an operator bool and an owns lock member function. They do the same thing. They simply tell you whether it's currently locked, whether this unique lock owns the lock on the mutex. You can release the mutex. You can say, you know, stop uh, tracking that mutex. Don't do anything with it. Don't unlock it in the destructor. And it returns a pointer because it may not, you know, you may have called release before, so it didn't have one. But it'll give you a pointer back to the mutex that was originally handed off to it. And then the mutex member function simply gives you a pointer to the mutex it holds if you know, that it's referencing if it has one. So if you called release before, then mutex is going to return an all pointer. Otherwise, based on the constructors of this, it had to have had a mutex. Again, no differences. OK. When you've got multiple threads that need to lock several different mutexes, you always want to lock them in the same order. Otherwise, you're going to end up with deadlocks. So to make that easy, we have lock functions. You give them a set of, of uh, lock, lockables, and it will acquire them in the same order, whatever order that may be. It doesn't specify what the order is, just that they will always be done in the same order if they're given as arguments in the same order. And what's really nice is in having them provided by the library is it takes care of all the exception mess. In other words, if trying to lock any particular one through an exception, it knows to go unlock all the ones that had already been locked and to you know, take care of all those details. The idea is either they're all locked or none of them are locked when you're finished. Uh, takes uh, an arbitrary number of lockables, at least one doesn't make sense to have zero. And you have both a lock and a try lock version. This one returns something rather odd. If it succeeds, you get minus one. Seems a little funny. But the reason is, if any of these lockables you give to it can't be locked, in other words, when you call try lock on them, it re 
that returns false, then what you get back is the zero-based index of the argument that failed to lock. Boost, slightly different, can only have up to five locks. It's using overloading to support that number. They also have an iterator-based overload. You can give it a, an iterator range of lockables and it'll walk through that for you. Okay, condition variable next. This guy is used to uh, communicate changes of state from one thread to another. The idea is you've got a changer whose job is to uh, make some change to state. You've got a waiter that's looking to see when that state change has occurred. So the changer's job is grab a mutex, change the state, and then notify one or, if you like, all waiting threads that the state has changed. The waiter's job is to acquire the mutex, wait on the condition variable, examine the state, and possibly repeat, depending on certain things. Here's what it looks like. Default constructor, neither copyable nor movable. So create it somewhere with wide enough scope, pass around a reference to get to it all the places you need it. Notify one, notify all. The job here is if there's a thread waiting on the condition variable, at the moment you call one of these functions, then that thread or those threads will be released. Wait takes a mutex, a, a unique lock on a mutex. The job here is atomically, all in one atomic operation, release the mutex and wait for notify one or notify all to be invoked. So this is what the waiter is going to do. He's going to call this and it's just going to go to sleep very efficiently, wait around until somebody calls notify one or notify all. This version takes a predicate. The reason is because just calling wait and when it returns saying, okay, the state changed, off we go, is not a good plan. The reason is because wait can return spuriously. That is to say, because of implementation details and for efficiency's sake and that sort of thing, wait may sometimes wake up when notify wasn't called. And so you need to make sure that you really should have awakened. How do you do that? You actually have to examine state. So you've got to keep track of state that says, yep, it really was supposed to be, uh, you know, you really were supposed to wake up. And if you don't discover that that's the case, you go back around and call wait again. With the predicate, it's just an ordinary callable. The idea is, while that predicate is not satisfied, continue to wait. In other words, it's going to run a while loop for you, so you don't have to code it yourself. While the predicate's not satisfied, call wait. Just keep on going until it's finally satisfied. You can also do it for limited time, with and without a predicate. And uh, there's also a wait until version, but I'm interspersing this because this returns CV status. And for CV status, you get no timeout and timeout. Timeout makes a lot of sense. Gee, the timeout ex was exceeded, but no timeout could mean that it was spuriously awakened. So just like the, the regular wait, which returned void, the fact that it returned doesn't tell you that everything is good yet. So here's the, the wait until to complete the picture. Works the same in boost. Condition variable any is just like condition variable, except that all the wait functions take an arbitrary lockable. If you think back to the slides for uh, condition variable, it only took, all the wait functions only took a unique lock of a mutex, just that one type. This one will take any lockable. So everything's all the same except when you look at the different weights, their function template based on that lockable type. All the rest of it looks exactly the same. So then you say, yeah, so why both of them? It's just for efficiency's sake. The um, um, condition variable can be more efficient, can take advantage of certain uh, internal details of using a unique lock on a std mutex that condition variable any cannot. Um, and it's interesting that std variable any is implemented usually in terms of the form. In other words, it uses a condition variable, uh, but its implementation is non-trivial. Uh, 
and it's actually very subtle and that's why it's in the standard. One time invocation. This is where you've got some initialization you want to occur exactly once, no matter how many threads are attempting it. You want it to be with no races, no deadlocks. You want some code to take care of all that nitty gritty stuff for you. And th this uh, mechanism also provides a strong exception guarantee. If in trying to invoke your initialization uh, function, it happens to throw an exception, then it doesn't count. Another thread gets a chance. Here's how it works. Create a stood once flag. It's got to have um, uh, sufficient scope so that all the different threads that are trying to use it have access to it. And you call std call once with that once flag. And then you call whatever your callable happens to be with whatever arguments it may need. So while this is a pretty trivial example and, and rather silly doing it from main, the notion is you're going to have multiple different threads. Think of a singleton pattern, for example, trying to create the one instance. You have multiple threads. They're all going to use the same once flag for the same particular initialization. You can call the same callable different times with different call once uses, a different once flag, if it's being used for different purposes. Yes? Do the threads which do not call the callable block in call once, or do I have to build that myself? Because after call once, I want to be sure that the function call initialize something completely. So the question is whether the other threads, if you've got multiple threads that are all attempting to call this at the same time, whether the threads that didn't get the chance to actually invoke it are blocked, and the answer is yes. Anything else? Uh, so here's what it looks like. It's, again, using um, uh, variadic template arguments. Pass in the once flag, the callable, and the arguments. Pretty simple. Boost is slightly different. You have to use static initialization from boost uh, once in it. And it only accepts zero argument callables, so you have to use bind to collect things together so that if you needed arguments, they would be supplied that way. Well, we made it. We talked about all the, these new asynchronous computations, talking about the promises and futures and uh, stood async and so on the lower level stuff with stood threads, and uh, all the different synchronization primitives. So any other questions? Yes? Why was the interrupt point stuff left out of the standard? Why were interruption points left out of the standard? Um, there, was, there was just a lot of controversy on whether that was an appropriate feature. There was concern about. Um, its uh, interaction with stack unwinding and so on, which um, and I'm not sure what was in the, that particular proposal. Uh, as it's implemented in boost threads, I don't think it's an issue at all because you're deciding um, to call the interrupt function. You're deciding to handle that particular exception. And you know where it can be thrown and so on. I mean, we already have to deal with exceptions anyway in lots of places. So I don't know this, the exact answer for that. Yes? If you have a stood future, is there any way to um, say release it so you don't end up waiting on the destructor if you haven't called yet? The question was, if you have a stood future, can you in some way release it so that you don't actually have to block so the destructor does not block? And the answer is no. If you pass it off, yes? There's uh, some discussion and some proposals that if you touch the future. Okay. So Hartman's answer is that there is a proposal to suggest adding detach to std future that would offer just what you're asking. Yes? When there are um, spurious, uh, spurious wake-ups, uh, why isn't there uh, a reliable wait function? Why is the re wait function, why can it return spuriously? Why isn't there a reliable form of that? Efficiency. The, just to make it reliable would make it slower. And so the idea is to make it, you know, put the onus on you because it'd be a pain the other way. So with regard to that same thing, so every time that you would do a wait, you're, you're generally going to have to do some other work in order to see if it was an appropriate wake up, right? 
So the question is, every time you're calling weight, you, you have some other work to go along with it in order to find out whether it was spurious or the real thing. Yes, you have to examine your state to find out if it's valid. So I just wonder why, why not just put that in the function so you have to do that every time? So why not put that evaluation into the function so you don't have to do it every time? Guess what? That's why the predicate's there, the predicate overload. You define in the predicate what it means for the weight to be valid, and then that version of weight takes care of it for you. Anything else? Oh, yes. Um, the thread ID, mm -hmm. um, is it like this where it's the, um, not necessarily the platform thread ID? Is the thread ID in any way associated with the platform ID? I, I don't believe I saw anything that specified what it was. I think it's just it's unique for every thread. That's all it says. All right. Yes. OK. okay. Uh, is there any good way to launch thread with specific attributes? Uh, mm. As far as I can remember, uh, Boost Thread provides such extension. Right. I actually mentioned that in the slide. Boost Thread does offer attribute support. You can, when you create the thread, you can give it uh, extra information about the attributes to control the stack size, that sort of thing. But there's nothing like that in Stood Thread. Yes. And just uh, two quick notes about complex loss implication. Uh, this thread, that, or get current thread ID or whatever it is, that's an incredibly slow function for some reason. Also, call once is 1500, it's 1,500 times slower than it should be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the, the comments back here are Microsoft's uh, stood this thread get ID is very slow. And their call once is the figure given was 1,500 times slower than it ought to be. Wow. So I don't know if that means compared to boosts, call once or what, but. 1,500 times slower than the Win32 API for doing the same thing. So interesting. That is, an, that is very much a substantial abstraction penalty. That is not required at all. <laughs> Anything else? Yes? So did I get it correctly that if I've got two futures and I want to sort of wait until one of them is ready that there isn't an API version for that yet and that I have to call them? If you have two futures and you want to determine when both of them are ready, how do you do that, basically? You want to know when the first one is ready before you wait on the second? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're going to have to run a loop doing a, a timed wait. Yeah, there, there's no support for, for the algebra like David was asking earlier. Yes? Yes? Right. Yeah, so uh, similar to the earlier answer, what he's mentioning here is there are some proposals, and I know that uh, uh, Vicente is doing the same thing for Boost Threads to implement some functions like when all and, and when any and so on to give you some of that um, uh, higher level algebra on futures. Uh, so I don't know when what the status of that proposal is, but people are thinking along those same lines. So. Anything else? All right, lunchtime.